Hey there, it's Eugene here. I kind of found that I wrote a book I forgot about, sort of. Um, pretty much just put it in the back burner and forgot about it. It's a pretty short little book. It's 100 something, 123 pages. Um, so pretty much what it is, I think I wrote this during the summer in New Mexico. It's kind of bored out of my mind during the mornings where either my friends were working, going to school, or, uh, or sleeping in. So pretty much just would go to coffee shop, store book slash coffee shop, and you kind know, of read my books. Got bored of my mind and wrote this. Um, so pretty much it's a basic idea of what I believe gamification was or should be based on my interpretation. This isn't my original view of it. Um, I have, for example, you go to here, the, these are kind of the maxims, which I call, I kind of took it from Nietzsche or Napoleon's military maxims, kind of like the title. Basic bullet points of what I believe works, what doesn't work. And then I kind of go with chapters and pretty much just going over different type of games, defining some terms. Uh, I think the Mario Party was some, like this sort of method uh, kind of work with when doing sales and call center, call center, for example, um, and doing some management that and stuff like that. So pretty much some definitions, what I believe works, what doesn't work, the theory behind it, some stuff I worked on when I was a manager, what I applied. Um, so basically that, that's what it is. If you look here, So I last time I used it was 2016, June 28th, just some edits I did today. Um yeah, June 8th. So this is a 20 day book. Well, quite a book, books, maybe 120 pages, but yeah, pretty much it's bored out of mind, out of my mind in Mexico, type this up. So might as well if I could do like a you know, YouTube video. I don't even know if anyone's gonna listen to this or even likes listening to me in my dumb little accent. But um basically what I'll do is yes go over some of the basic concepts either for anyone or just for my own entertainment. Kind of like reading or listen to myself after a few years. Um so what I've done before uh, I used to write for here, 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 see here the URL, Gamification Corpse. And I didn't spend a lot of time in the gamification community in general. Um, but yeah, pretty much these are some of the tags. I'm trying to make the whole screen a little bigger. It's not. Um, this allows me to move it. So these are some of the tags. Um, if you see the total number of articles, I think it was 18. I think there might have been a few more that were not associated with me, maybe two or three if I remember correctly, but I might be wrong. So pretty much the first one, this this is for sure the first one, August 2013. Um, and the last one was October 2014. This is one of my favorites actually. So for example, it's, this this one's pretty cool too, kind of like a more of a scientific one. Um, so yeah, I mean, I had quite a lot of views there, and they used to be like these trackers on Twitter, for example, the most popular um, articles on Twitter. And usually, my stuff was on the top. They do a quick search, like for example, twenty thirteen uh, top educational stuff. This this is one of mine. Um, so I was definitely on top of their, um, website and definitely my stuff seemed to have been trending on Twitter quite often. And they would have to do like this, uh, these top 10 or like this top articles on this category, which would be gamification of the week. And usually I was up there when I was doing this stuff. So this is for uh, Gabe Sickerman. I really, really liked this guy, Gabe Sickerman. So originally I bought his books and actually a O'Reilly course he had. Um, pretty much on gamification. I think it cost me like $50. 
Um, so it's not not a crazy amount, but I mean, it's, it's still some nice chunk of change. So I was spending money on on Gabe Sickerman specifically, and I think I contacted a guy after watching uh, an interview by Robert Greene on his latest book at the time, Mastery. And pretty much said, yeah, dude, if you're young, just offer yourself to work for free and see if you can get your foot in. So that's, that's what I did. I asked the guy, hey, uh, do you need some help translating in Spanish? I'll do it for free. They said yes. Um, I believe it translated some stuff for them, which they never published. Um, but I offered to write some article in English. And they said, yeah, go for it, which was this was my first article. And they liked it a lot. And pretty much just asked me to write more. Um, if you go here, I think I did do one um, article in Spanish. Here it is. Um, La Gamificación. I, I told him, I don't know the title. I don't know the title. I really like this one, actually. But yeah, they have one title in Spanish at the end of the middle of it. But I believe this is the only Spanish title I ever did, even though it translated some stuff. Anyways, um, back to it. So pretty much I have written some stuff i kind of know the concept um i like gabe sicker man i like a guy called uh michael ugos who wrote the book uh enterprise games so those were the two books that kind of well not book well, there gave how a few books so pretty much gabe sicker manning michael ugos were the guys kind of introduced me to the concept but um generally i do not like gamification or the people talked about it or the girls it's, it kind of creeps me out um, they seem to be, how do you say it, they over infantilized, they kind of remind me of that person, for example, that's been really traumatized, and in order to overcome their trauma, they go over the top in the whole positivity and happiness movement, the whole basic idea behind that, and these overdo it. And they tell you to walk up, you know, if only you follow this stuff I'm doing, you could find happiness or something, right? And you just forget about your past. Well, the thing is, if you had a nice past, um, or even if you didn't have a nice past, you probably don't want to forget about it. Anyways, it, it, they just focus too much on that whole happiness and positivity. And they have all these cartoon characters. It's, it creeps me out. And what I like about Gabe Sicker, man, is that he didn't seem to be what you call the ideologue, if, for lack of a better term. So basically, like a lot of the gurus, and please note that I'm doing broad strokes. I haven't been involved with it probably since the end of 2014. So that's the last article I wrote about it. Um, but... A lot of things is just is creeping out. You have this whole notion that gamification is going to change the world, bring a new era of happiness. They call it the pleasure revolution sometimes. Um, pretty much, they'll have to bring a new era of happiness, and everyone's going to be smiling and entertained, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they they got the, it's it's weird, man. It's like they have this sort of cult-like notions and a lot of stuff doesn't make any sense but the way you act and you just promote it and it's weird so Gabe Sigerman kind of seemed very down-to-earth business like okay man I got some cool tricks they seem to be working for marketing and they seem to be applying some other stuff um yeah this, this is pretty much what what it is here are a few case studies where it work might apply your in your uh, circumstances right he was very practical and he seems to have written i mean started a few businesses and so on so you have to be quite practical in that sense um so i i really like the guy but i don't agree with everything he says i don't agree with everything michael ugo says um but that being said, those, those were the main guys. And then you got the whole other cluster ecology of, uh, of gamification gurus, which I completely uh, disagree with. And a lot of the problems with the uh, general concept of gamification comes from, I would say, a lack of understanding 
um, how logic works. Because you got your deductive logic, inductive, and abductive, right? So deductive is more like a platform mathematical formulas. I mean, not, not, not necessarily, but mostly it's pretty much just A equals B, B equals C, then A equals C, right? Um, inductive logic might be you wake up in the morning and you see that there's water drops over your window, right? So what the cost, what is the cost for that? Well, maybe it rained, maybe the sprinklers went off, maybe some kid was playing with a water gun and sprayed over your window, right? So it's, that, that that's inductive logic. So there, there's a few possibilities that are coherent, but it's not certain. And then abductive logic, which the book, uh, A Moment of Clarity, for example, um, what's the name? Um, Red Associates, I believe, the consultancy that that I was working on that. And then there's Cognitive Edge with Gabe Sickerman. No, sorry, not Gabe Sickerman. Sorry, uh, Dave Snowden. Um, that's, that's about abductive logic. So that's pretty much more like an anthropologist um, walking through jungle and studying a culture for the first time, right? Or or he's, he's trying to understand it. So you just go there, observe, and try to get rid of all preconceived notions, find some patterns by the observation, and make connections about stuff that are seemingly unrelated, but turns out that they are related, right? So that's the basic gist of it. So they, they, they don't understand this stuff. Some of the big problems about gamification, for example, they were misusing deductive logic. So deductive logic is very narrow in the premises you can use in the real world. For example, what I mean by this is you, you, you want to keep deductive logic within the context or field you're talking about. You don't want to go over the top and t use different premises. So give me, give me, give me one example. Um, and Anthropologists, for example, since we were talking about that, or a biologist. So a, you cannot t look at an anthill and say, well, since the ants kind of live like in a complex city, and when you do this, this is how the ants behave. Therefore, this is how humans would behave if this would have happened. I don't know, like maybe a flood or whatever. Um <clears throat> That doesn't work, right? You, you can, you cannot go ahead and apply a premise from a different field, which would be, say, biology and ants, into something like sociology, psychology, anthropology, right? And that's where the logic breaks. So one of the problems with gamification, for example, they have the idea of the uh, dopamine triggers, which they use this deductive logic. So they say, well, if dopamine triggers in video games and we have taken the secret of video games and they focus on video games specifically they talk about this there's a secret of video games it's so engaging that's what they focus on it they themselves they say this so if the dopamine triggers are in video games you apply this concept into non-game concepts like say work or studying therefore these dopamine triggers are being triggered outside the video games and that's what they call it the dopamine revolution for example they make this very specific very explicit sorry um and that's not how it works that's a misuse of deductive logic yes because it triggers in the video game that's not mean you're having a similar effect outside of the video game and you will have to analyze that specifically um is this gamification management technique or whatever really doing this go ahead and do some studies and find out how long this will last most gamification uh management techniques i, I, I can remember reading like only three months like what, what would happen is that you get a company that pays for this new management technique method pretty much gamification they apply it it seems most of the time it failed i believe that Gardner has some study either 70% or 80% failed out flat. So most of the time it was not going to even work. So that the 20% leftovers that did work, um, someone else did a study 
I uh, can't remember who it was. This is this a lot of this stuff is gonna be anecdotal, right? It's I haven't messed around with it since probably the beginning of 2015 is when I I stopped reading the crap and everything. Um, but someone else did a study and how long did these effects and gamification last in those that did succeed? And the results were about three months. So after three months, the, or less, let's say, I believe it was, so the, the novelties wore off. So pretty much you have the, the employees doing it. Oh, it's kind of cool. They're behind it. They do it, they do it, they do it. And they just get bored and the whole thing collapses, which makes sense. I mean, even if you have, for example, an actual game, you play it for a while, you will get bored. <coughs> so assuming, <coughs> oh, sorry, one second here. So even assuming that this would even work, it doesn't last very long. Mm, sorry, I lost my train of thought, but Like, can you guru is not going to tell you that like what these guys would do what essentially what what it was like that, that that's the figure of logic right it's it's not creating dopamine triggers and the gamification guru is not going to tell you straight up hey man um i'm going to charge you thousands of dollars to do this you're probably probably your job your manager is going to be on the line of doing this um probably going to be a pain for the employees might probably not going to even work up front, 80% of these statistics, according to, like, hey, I think it was Gardner that said this, um, will fail. And, of course, the gamification guru had a very good response for that, for why does 80% of the uh, gamification methods fail, right? So this should probably tell you, <laughs> if you had an 80% chance of failure and you're a manager, why would you want to apply gamification in the first place right you're probably going to fail and those that do succeed only last three months but garter original are going to say that why would you want to do it the gamification group would say uh the reason why it failed this is not what Gardner said this is what they said uh, maybe not but the reason why it failed is because they did not understand they need the management that applied this gamification correctly so what the gamification um well, what the managers behind the gamification movement should do is spend more time and more money on the consultant to learn the stuff, a bunch of nonsense they created from pop psychology books and playing video games and some fantasies they put in their head. It's not unrelated, casual relationships. And pretty much just give the guru more money for it to succeed and beat the odds, which is succeed for three months and then collapse um they don't tell you stuff right so there's there's no damn evidence that the dopamine triggers are being triggered um generally i do not believe that the gamification girls are very honest like i said i'm doing some broad strokes um but this is based on some of the conversations i had with some of these people um one of the reasons why i was really disgusted with the gamification, gamification community is the use of video games on education, right? So the reason for this is that there, there's a huge demand for it. It kind of makes sense. For example, children play video games for ready to find that fun. Why wouldn't we have video games inside the classroom, right? It kind of, if you don't really think about it, it makes kind of sense. Um, and they really pushed this notion that video games, for example, are a better learning tool in general or games in general. Um, they have their benefit. For example, what games do, kind of going over myself, they, they teach you through a way that's called implicit learning and a type of knowledge called tacit knowledge. It's, that's a type of knowledge you cannot really ex like uh, explicitly codify, like say a word, number. But it's a type of knowledge that's there and can only be learned by doing something. An example with this, of this would be uh, riding a bike. Uh, you can read a book, see someone, have someone explain it to you, but you're not going to learn how to ride a bike until you get on the bike and fall a few times and figure it out. And that's the tacit knowledge. Um, games are really good at doing this, um, but there is a point of diminishing return. For example, if you've never done something ever, a game is 
simulation, for example, is a really good idea. But if you were a grown adult or a kid, there is a point of diminishing return where the simulation no longer makes sense. And then there's the whole notion of explicit knowledge, which the game is really bad at providing. Um, and I've read about this. There's, there's neurological pathways probably going over my head. I should, probably shouldn't mention it, but there's neurological pathways for implicit and ex, for for tacit knowledge, pretty much implicit learning and explicit knowledge. If you are playing and you release dopamine in your brain, you are triggering the implicit learning part of your brain and the explicit shuts down. I remember reading an article, I think I, I referenced it specifically on the systems-based gamification book I did, where it says you can't have both open at the same time. So explicit knowledge is very important, uh, which is what I guess goal focuses more, focus on the most. <clears throat> it's not to say that one is better than the other, but once you got the ex a implicit, the, the tacit knowledge foundation, Explicit knowledge increases expertise. An example of this is chess players. Um, the top performers of chess players, the grandmasters, um, were studied. And there's a correlation between the amount of books they've read. And I believe the guy studying this, some study called uh, Deliberate Practice in, grand, in Chess Expertise or some, some, something like that. I've referenced it before. So deliver practice and chess expertise or something like that, where they pretty much went to the houses to interview um, the grandmasters, chess players, and they went ahead and counted the books they own. And by that, they determined whoever has more books, there was a correlation between the score they had in chess. So Going back to the gamification gurus, a lot of them were actually saying explicitly some of their TED talks that um, books might be going away, and that might be a good thing because we have video games to replace it. So there's there's this basic science behind it that's flawed, but kind of went into rambling and miss and over over the point. The point being is that they're trying to put this game video games on the kids and. They have done studies where the amount of screen time a kid, a kid has starts to negatively affect um, their brain. So I can't remember the exact numbers and it varies between ages, like some, something between like two hours when you're really young. And as you grow, you're allowed to have more screen time before you start seeing these negative effects. And the negative effects are pretty much um, developing a lot of autistic behaviors in what would have been otherwise normal healthy kids because what happens is that instead of interacting with people and learning like social cues voice tonality facial expression social context they're looking at a screen and they're not learning all these social cues, for example. That that's one of the things that happens, but there seems to be like some general brain damage that starts generating based on the number of screen time. So I would ask, and, and these, these guys know this. Um, there's this book, I can't remember her freaking name, but it's the author of Reality is Broken. She had like this big curly um, blonde hair. And I can't, I can't remember his name. I've, 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 I've written about her in the past. So she wrote that in that book. And and so that's kind of like the viable quote unquote the gamification community. And I told him, hey man, um, why are you promoting these video games if you know, for example, that they are causing brain damage? That hourly limit, they are the kids are already overdoing it without the screens on the classroom, right? Why would you introduce mandatorily? these screens into the classroom if you know it's going to cause brain damage. And it doesn't even matter what your game is. You could hypothetically have the best game for the case you can possibly imagine. It's the screen time affecting it. So no matter what you do in the game design, you are going to cause brain damage. And I have to this to actually a few people because I was perplexed. Why would you do this? Um, because I really like this. There's this guy, I can't remember the guy's name, but there's, there's a TED talk. It's called the World Peace Game. And this, I believe it's like Stumping Hunter, where 
there's a, there's a fourth grade teacher or around that age where it creates like these world peace games this really complex game and he's reading the kids Sun Tzu example and the kids are being interviewed they say that they're playing the game and he's reading Sun Tzu and playing the game makes them understand Sun Tzu which uh that's really really interesting but the game is made on the real world it's like kind of like this complex board game stuff like that I promote in sports but the video games that do it we know it's negatively affecting the kids why are you doing this and almost like clockwork man what they start telling me is like oh i know about those studies so pretty much what they're doing with is they're kind of saying haha i'm very well read about this subject and you're not going to uh one up me on this i already know about all this you're not telling me something i don't know so they're kind of trying to tell me they're knowledgeable but then you say, man, why, if you know about this, why are you promoting it? Then that stumps them, right? Why are you promoting it if you know it's causing brain damage? And they usually give you some incoherent blabbering about uh, the benefits of game, video games and blah, 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 blah. They kind of ignore it. Like, dude, okay, yes, there's some studies showing some benefits, but the screen time study, that doesn't mean it's no longer negative and you just tell already say you don't know about it and they just ignore it right so pretty much what it is is that they're making money out of it they are making money out of it and they're willing to cause brain damage to the kids for a profit because I'm not, sure, I'm not sure exactly the numbers, but pretty much consulting software companies or teachers or schools on how to have your kids focus, it's a very big part of their business. So they're completely dishonest. And a lot of guys used to like retweet or quote my stuff when they believe they could um, benefit from it. So pretty much what they would do, oh, check out this new article came out that encourages gamification this is why it works or something and they push their nonsense in there but if i contradict them one of the cases for this was for example was the uh richard bartler that's how you say it player types uh richard bartler himself said it was his player type which is pretty much the four four player types right it which is the reasons why people play MMOs, massively multiplayer online games, right? Um, and he did some study. He came up with four per, like player types for four reasons. One was, for example, they want to achieve something, so like points and want like high scores and points and all that stuff. Um, they want to socialize, so pretty much they wanted to hang out with their friends, talk to other people um so those were the socializers and the achievers and then there was the killers which just wanted to kill other people and then you have the explorers who wanted to roam around and explore stuff and see like the artificial you know worlds and doing so richard barthler kind of wrote about that so the gamification community for example picked it up and turned into these complex not complex sorry these um explicit personality types Kind of like the uh, Briggs and Meyer personality types, right? You got introvert, extroverts, and those combinations. So they picked it up and they added their own uh, four by four square. So for example, we have the, the four basic player types from Bartler, which are now, now personality types. And they added some other stuff like, I can't remember, like the politicizer or some nonsense so they have this four by four types so you get 16 personality types and there's there's a lot of different variations of this so pretty much they just copy what Brian myers did which was it's a right nonsense by itself and they their own based on the, these player types and they push it like this like it's a fact and there's credibility behind it oh someone who's a professor and knows about um 
games has said this, but if you look at what Richard Bartler is still alive and said about this, he pretty much said they got it all wrong. He never said there were player types. And there's, there's a whole video about this, him talking about this, specifically about gamification, how they got it all wrong and how they're misinterpreting his work. So he gives the example. It's, um, I think I think he used metaphor. I think he might have used a different word. I can't remember. So pretty much he was, was comparing it. Um, he's saying, yeah, I said player tasks or like personality type, but I didn't mean it literally that there's a personality type. And he said, and it only applies in the context of MMOs, not in games in general and not outside games. You're so they're pretty much lying about this to gamification gurus that this player type is universal. Richard Bartlett doesn't claim it is, right? And it was never meant to be personality type. And you should pro and he actually explicitly said you should not use this on your game design because you might be missing out on other reasons why the people are playing the game that you're not aware of. So if you come with this notion that oh these are the four factors or what have you, right? They play the game and design the game accordingly you're probably going to do a bad design game. So he even said, you don't design your game based on my player types. It's just kind of like a basic frame of reference, you know, like to stand on and move on. And what they do, they literally took this literal player types. Sorry, they, they took this and converted it to a literal play, like personality types. And it's all nonsense, right? So I would write about this, a... um. This doesn't really seem to work. And you know, even Malcolm Gladwell has um, whole articles talking about the the uh, use of personality types on business in general and how it's false and doesn't make any sense. So I, I'm quoting Malcolm Gladwell, I'm quoting Richard Bartlett, the creator of this stuff. Um, I don't think we got this right. And now when I do this, um, <laughs> I remember these, these communication girls go up and start like ramp the same people sharing my articles to sell their BS are now saying that I'm not an expert. I don't know what I'm talking about. That really pissed me off. And we actually got a quite a, like online social fight. I stayed with gamification core for, I don't know, six months more or something. And I did ask Gabe Sickerman for, um, for for some money and I, I think what what I ask him I think I ask him um hey man I'm running for articles blah 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 uh I would like to get paid for it and I think maybe he had the idea of me being part time and I kind of want to go full time with the guy like I don't know say what what do you say like fifty thousand a year or something like that I can work with you and he never replied back to my email um so he's fine with the article as being paid like a few hundred or for free but well, he didn't pay me a few hundred. I had other people pay me like that, but um, yeah, and that, that was the end of it. And it seems like the gamification corp, uh, a lot of the people stopped working there after I feel a little bit after that. So like when I left, it seems like, it seems like the whole thing collapsed. Um, and they left. So I don't know if there were financial problems or something, but I really wanted to work that. I really wanted to work with that guy originally, Gabe Sigerman. I really liked him a lot. But that's basically the long winded rant. I probably should have not took so long saying it, if at all. But, anyways, so in order to determine what I am, you gotta determine what you're not. So, I've been rambling so far, so I think it's going to stop doing this. But basically, I'll probably should just say this. Basically, the falsehood of gamification in general is they focus too much on video games. And one of the big problems with that is that the video games are a fantasy world. And I kind of tell them, it's a fiction, man. And you, you have, you have to realize it's a fiction. And when I say that, they kind of defend themselves and say, you're focusing too much narrative instead of game mechanics and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. What you're doing with a video game is creating a literal virtual fictional world, right? 
some of the dopamine triggers that's being caused in that virtual made up world cannot be replicated into the real world. And one of the reasons, for example, well, I mean, one, one of the evidences for this can be explicitly seen in games in general, right? So you have two types of games. You got the skill based games, which is kind of what you see here, a picture of Achilles and <laughs> Ajax, one of my favorite works of art of Greece. Um, so skill-based games in the real world are chess, for example, are um, sports. And I got this from the guy who wrote a, uh, a theory of fun, Rolf Kosher, cost something like that, probably mispronounced his name. Not American. These American names are hard to pronounce. Um... And he had, and he came up with his original concept. Um, so the skill-based games are games where you can only advance if um, you improve your skill sets. Time-based games, which is what most video games are, are games that you're going to win no matter what and advance. It's just a matter of time. And a lot of the uh, things video games do is create artificial power-ups. And I had a quote from Nietzsche to describe this pretty much the same happiness as the feeling power is being over, like it's increasing and challenges are being overcome. It's one of the first pages from his Antichrist book, uh, which I think fits very well to this description. So pretty much what it is, is that the time-based games, it's fantasy, right? You are, for example, a goblin slayer talking about some RPG game, a fantasy game. So you have a magical sword and you get in your armor and go kill goblins. It's at first it's kind of hard, but then you create a, you get a new sword or you level up or something like that. And now your attack points and your defense points have increased. And now you can kill the goblin a lot easier. And it's fun for a little while. You got the artificial power up level. But then a harder goblin shows up right before it becomes too boring. And that goblin kills you. And you try to kill it and it kills you again. So you're doing a side quest and you get the new magic sword. And this new magic sword allows you to kill the stronger goblin. And now you got that whole sense of empowerment. Right? In the real world world you cannot recreate this this is a complete work of fiction that the video games are able to create right in the real world let's say door door sales right you cannot give your sales rep a magic little hat it says awesome bobby now your skill sets for selling or persuasion or whatever you want to call it, have increased for 20%. Let's adjust the difficulty level, Bobby. So it seems like your the doors are knocking are a bit too hard. Let's let's put it to the easy mode so you can get some easy sales and build up your confidence, Bobby. Oh, this is a weather too hot. Let me change the weather, right? You cannot do any of these changes. The problem it was gamification that they don't understand this. You cannot have godlike powers in order to create the virtual world like the, the 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 changes in the virtual world that would cause these dopamine triggers and the real world if you want to increase in your skill set you have to work hard you have to add pressure this is painful this is sometimes very boring and repetitive you know, you're doing you're doing training for chess, sports, sales, it's repetitive and it's training. And that's one of the failures of gamification in general, right? So they have this whole concept that the whole world can be really fun if only they apply these video game techniques. Dude, you cannot do it because the whole concept of the video, the concept of the video games is these artificial power ups. This illusion of mastery. And they talk about this mastery stuff all the time in gamification. Oh, you have to create a mastery. And they even have, they, they literally try to recreate the algorithms or the, the point systems of the video game. And it's like, oh, you achieved this score. So now we upgraded you to level two, uh, which is so patronizing if you're 
to adults. I mean, how imagine if you're an employee, you're a grown man or woman, and this little fat little manager dude shows up and says, Good job, Bobby. Now you're level two. Now you're with the big boys. Now, Bobby, you're level two because you did your job. Pat on the back. That's basically how, like a lot of communication nonsense is. It's it doesn't work for adults. You you gotta realize the type of quote unquote games adult plays are quite different. You have a group of engineers or something. Their type of games might be simply joking around with each other, making jokes, making fun of each other, ha ha ha. That's literally the type of quote unquote games they're playing. And the workforce, and this, and if you ever work in really stressful situations, you realize that these type of quote unquote jokes become more prevalent in really hardworking, stressful situations. Come to relieve the pressure, crack some jokes, and people, even in general, right? If you're in a really hard, stressful situation, people crack some stupid joke and start laughing, kind of like an excuse yes to laugh, and they don't freaking play the little stupid games. Good job, Bobby. You're 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 level three now. Um, damn, I freaking lost when I trying to thought again. Where was I? So yeah, so that's the biggest shit. Like they they have this notion where they can recreate this. You cannot do it. Like you have to therefore ignore um time based games in the virtual world since you cannot replicate those artificial power ups and instead you have to look at skill based games in the real world and the real real world skill based games do not operate the way the gamification gurus claim their gamification techniques operate if you learn how to play chess if you're learning how to play a sports you don't get the gamification treatment right if, if you were to, to try to create those those uh dopamine triggers all the time like you get in the video game it doesn't work that way they cannot even gamify a game in the real world chess sports what makes you believe that they would be able to gamify anything else the workplace for example um how the skill-based games in the real world work is that it's through something called deliberate practice. And there's 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 a guy, I think his first name is Anders Ericsson. So or maybe Eric Eric. Um yeah. so it's it's Ericsson. I, I have a freaking book of him. I did a video for him not too long ago. Um previous past it's called concept called uh, deliberate practice. And he has this whole basic bit of what it is. So it's a type of practice where you're deliberately trying to improve your skills it's uh really intensive so you're pushing yourself to the limit it's so it's hard and it's very repetitive and it focuses on negative feedback not positive feedback for what i mean by that it's not oh you're negative you're, you're a naysayer but if you did something wrong right so if you did something wrong you get immediate feedback that your technique or whatever is being performed wrong you stop you told, you're told how to do it correctly, hopefully from a coach, and do it again slowly until you get it right, right? So that's basically deliberate practice. So it's the guy dribbling the ball in the basketball court again and again, making those three-pointer shots again and again, and pretty much just training, right? So what these guys, the gamification girls, trying to do is tell you, oh, you guys don't need to do that repetitive boring stuff. What we're gonna do is create a gamification world where everything's gonna be fun, which it's so damn creepy. It's actually, if you ever read um, Huxley, I know I'm gonna mispronounce his name, Aldous Huxley, Huxley. Um, he wrote the book, for example, A Brave New World, he and, it's a Huxley, Huxleyan uh, dystopia, what they're trying to do. Essentially, what the gamification guru is trying to do, and they used to talk more about this, like in their stuff about 2011, 2012, they have this whole concept between the worlds will be separated between two groups. Those who are the designers, by that, pretty much those who learn game design, and are creating the gamification systems, and those who are being gamed, those the players are being controlled by the gamification systems. So they have this sort of power trips 
if you read that stuff from that period, um, where they're pretty much saying there's going to be the people controlling you and those who are controlled, you have to learn gamification to be the people in power. The rhetoric did change kind of sometimes between 2013 and 14 onwards, where it's more like, hey, we're trying to help the world and make a better play. So that whole power dynamic did change, but it did exist for a while. And the same people saying that were the same people that switched the narrative. So pretty much they're switching over to see what's... Uh, for for marketing like what what sells more they did a lot of the whole concept of them is yes their personas um so pretty much they cannot get rid of deliberate practice and one of the things they do actually is they misrepresent deliberate practice so deliberate practice is something they have mentioned before but they'll say stuff like for example um since the average american boy mainly has played twenty thousand hours of video games by the age of 20 something i believe it was they have been deliberately practicing for 20 for twenty thousand hours and this is something the uh book reality is broken says uh, specifically and they they generally picked up so therefore they are a whole generation of world-class experts of video game players and therefore if you make the world more like a game you're going to take advantage of these world-class experts who will apply their video game skills into that new gamified system you pay them to create and if you don't create this you're not going to take advantage of these expertise quote unquote well that's not what deliberate practice is and I probably, I mean, I, I did another video on it where it really can go in there, but that's not what it is. They, they, they don't even know what the hell they're talking about. And if you read that book, Reality is Broken, um, I might have been mistaken. I think it's chapter 10 or 11, something like that. I mean, it's been years. And if I remember correctly, they reference Malcolm Gladwell, I believe it was Outliners, which in turn, doesn't really specify very well what deliberate practice is. So what Malcolm Gladwell does is he seems like a pretty smart guy, but he oversimplifies the book uh, to create a general audience of uh, people that are casually going into this 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 knowledge. Like they're, they're not going to go read peer review or like articles and try to figure out what exactly is being said. Gets, gets a general overview and now you have the problem where you have what is this telephone game pretty much where Malcolm Gladwell reads the original source and he oversimplifies it and the gamification people or like this book Rally is Broken reads Malcolm Gladwell that over, oversimplification and pretty much just gets oh 10,000 hours of doing something therefore that's me as me they're world class expert that playing games so she says that and the whole people well the gamification girls <clears throat> that must mean with much hardness these world-class experts and this can only be done by creating a gamified world and like this bunch of nonsense man even if they did develop some general skills which there's some evidence that there is some depending on i mean there, there there's a point of diminishing return if you if you ever had gamer employees which i had i, I mean i had a daughter knocking which i did for, for for college we would pick up and go to a different state and live in the same apartment complex right so you get to see these people the hardcore gamers the ones that have to bring their tv and xbox with them because they cannot live without gaming they could not withstand the real world. All this nonsense, which is the reality is broken, and other people are saying that these the people are more resilient and they learn about um, overcoming obstacles by trial and error, and they're not discouraged. This is literally what they're saying in the TED Talks. You can go back to the freaking, freaking uh, 2011, 2012 TED Talks, and this is literally what they're saying. But the gamers are the greatest generation pretty much ever. Uh, paraphrasing that part but yeah that they're resilient that they overcome obstacles um, blah 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 they got all these skills and you look at the real gamer like the game addicts they're the exact opposite man they cannot deal with rejection they complain all the time they cannot get stuff done and 
people who have played sports do get it, like real world games and um, skill based games. It, it's a hard process. It's going to be painful. And slowly but surely, if you keep at it and trying, you will improve. Um, and even like, it's like this whole concept of video game players are these great employees. Is like I, I, mean, I, I play video games as, as, as for fun. So like I, I've said this before, and they they always try to twist my words, and they go on saying, "Oh, he's saying the video game players are all losers." Like no, that's that's not what I'm saying. And there, there's a point of diminishing return where you get these weirdo addicts of video games. That they're just broken and they cannot deal with the real world. And the probably the reason why they're in the video game world is to hide from the real world. So if you get, for example, say a 20-year-old, two 20-year-olds, right? One has spent um his afternoons since he was 16 to 20, most of them working a part-time job or a full-time job. Right? Say maybe he's going to school, but he's 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 been working in the real world to say a, a waiter. Um, and then you got the other teenager, which has been spending his time playing video games at age 20, it's been four years now, which person do you believe is going to have a better work ethic, be able to communicate with people, uh, develop new skills, the guy killing goblins in his mother's basement, or the guy who actually had a real job for those four years? Okay, we're talking about 20 year olds. Um, it's gonna be the 20 year old man. If you if if I would get a sales rep that has had like any job experience, for example, like that, or someone that has none or little and plays a lot of time playing video games, the video game player employee sucks. Um so you anyways, again, I freaking do this a lot going around. Lean. The original point was you have to base um gamification on real world games skill based games chess and sports for example and like a lot of business um like a sales rep for example really naturally do this but the whole concept of the gamification community is basing it on video games which have these artificial power-ups that cannot be translated to a real world and so having art, let me, let me Google this right now. Um, so there have been articles where um, talking about the effects of uh, video game addiction. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. Yeah, so you can see some of my Google searches right there. So, what was it? <clears throat> so here's one of them talked about it. So it's independent. So basically, I can't remember the guy's name. So basically, here here few articles like this. There's like a ton of articles talking about it. Um, they talk about video game addiction is leading to masculinity crisis. Say Stanford psychologist. So pretty much the basic gist of it of this whole study um, was that um, the boys or men specifically are getting these high levels of dopamine triggers happening to them through video games, which is the artificial power-ups, right? Which is what the gamification gurus claim they can recreate in the real world. No, they cannot. Uh, if you, you cannot even recreate this gamification sort of kid game triggers in real games and in, in, in adults that play games as a profession athletes for example chess players what makes you believe you can do it outside games bro it's not happening so these video games are creating these artificial power-ups where the uh, brain is being stimulated with dopamine triggers again and again and again and again like i said these are artificial these can only happen on the uh virtual world right 
Um, so what is happening is that the dopamine receptors of the brain are being overstimulated. So in order to have this homeostasis uh, to be feel normal, they reduce the dopamine receptors in the brain, also testosterone uh, re receptors, if, not, if I'm not mistaken. So they reduce these um, receptors and oh, look, the guy has a whole TED talk, didn't know that. And once you're outside in the real world, your receptors are, are decimated. So it's kind of like a person who drinks too much coffee um, after a while, but if he does not have coffee, he's falling asleep. All right. So he needs to have these five cups of coffee. Even in someone who doesn't drink coffee, doesn't need the coffee or have like one sip and he is uh, highly stimulated. So what's happened is that they, they lose their dopamine receptors and testosterone receptors and the reward parts of the brain. So the real world becomes really boring because it's not triggering these receptors. And the same thing happens with porn addiction. So pretty much porn addiction and video games work in a very similar way where the brain is trigger, 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 trigger these dopamine receptors and the reward areas. It gets overstimulated. It reduces the number of receptors. And now you feel feel that the real world is pretty boring. If you look at the TED Talks, a lot of these gamification gurus and the arguments they use for gamification is that the video game players have developed these complex games in, oh, sorry, these complex minds, brains are being rewired to be more complex. And the real world is just too boring because these video game kids or adults or what have you, um, having having stimulated to be have these complex brains and pretty much they're not being challenged in the real world and that's the basic gist of it too there, there, there's no damn evidence for this bullshit theory you have right yeah maybe may, might be the case but if you actually were a manager managing people say sales reps and like i did this i freaking lived with these video game people the gamers and you know who the gamer is because they bring their goddamn game console and that's all they want to do in their free time the gamers suck they complain about everything mama nya, nya. They close the door, they were mean, they don't want to put the work in, they don't want to train with you, and then you just have to send them home because after two or three weeks, they can't sell, sell anything. Sorry, bro, you're working off commission. If you can't sell, we can't really pay you, can we? Um, and this is more of the explanation. Um, I mean, in my, my opinion, it's a way better explanation than, uh, than um, what they're promoting. And this is actually backed up. So the whole, they, they, they have all these theoretical, well, I don't know if it's like, like rationalities, it, it's, it's the better word. So they have those reasons, right? It, it, this application of deductive logic. So going back to what I freaking said almost an hour ago, oh my God, <laughs> is that um, they have all these rationalized, rationalizations where, um, Where these make stuff up. Um, for example, the the whole concept. You, you you can see the TED talks. They claim that the reason why the, the gamification needs to be applied into the real world because these gamers are better employees. They have more complex brains, and the real world is boring them. Therefore, with gamification, you add you're adding that extra level of complexity in the real world, and therefore. They need that extra level of complexity in order to be engaged, right? So this might be the case in boring jobs, but again, you do your little bank vacation bullshit in some repetitive job, it's probably not gonna work very well or last very long because you're still doing that same freaking repetitive job. The um as a matter of myself, I can't have I'm probably talking about this later, but damn, dude, I'm freaking tired now. Um, <laughs> the real purpose of gamification or games in the job, in my experience as manager, is not to make the uh, job not feel like a job, which is the basic premise they have. No longer will you work because it's going to be so fun. Um, that That's bullshit, man. You, you, you cannot... 
stop working. Your work is gonna be your work. Even even people enjoy it. Like they don't, yeah, they, they do work and it's freaking hard. Um but like I say, you're if you're working in a call center, you're not gonna do some gamification bullshit. Either be a software or some 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 game on a screen and make them forget they're they're on a call center talking again and again to people who are probably screaming being rude pissed off or just plain idiots right you're not going to make them forget that so what is the purpose of games quote unquote in the uh, corporate setting instead it's not necessarily well, I mean, it's not, it's not necessarily as 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 not to make work feel like a game, but imagine work, especially like in call centers, it's more like a pressure cooker, right? So the pressure's building up, the pressure being building up, the pressure's being built up. This goes back to the example I gave before with engineers, right? So what do you do to relieve the pressure? Maybe you play some stupid little game. Go, uh, um yeah okay marissa made x amount of points good job marissa ring the honk she rings the honk because she made some sales or something every applause cool now we're going we're to move you up in this and that's that little five minutes or whatever it takes to relieve the pressure there's some laugh they get out of the, they get out of the uh the grind ha 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 then they get back to the ground like you don't try to masquerade and say hey you're not working you're actually playing the game and you should be happy finally you tell them you are working it's going to be hard and you have those little moments of joking around or playing some stupid little game okay cool you made this sale which means you can you can uh roll this dice or what I don't know, I like throw some darts or what have you and try to win this little stupid little prize you do that to relieve the pressure not to make them feel like they're in a freaking game which is a completely different perspective of what the gamification community at least when i was involved had um yeah i've been, been rambling for an hour and it's getting pretty late so i'm gonna end in here this is <laughs> probably not gonna be listened to anyone but uh, what is done is done. Screw it.